Hello and welcome back to the 25th annual George Mason Law Review Antitrust Symposium, celebrating 25 years of antitrust. My name is Carly Veeding and I am the symposium editor of the George Mason Law Review. This event is brought to you by the George Mason Law Review and the Global Antitrust Institute and is sponsored by Freshfields and CRA. Thank you for joining our panel, Big Tech Antitrust Litigation. Our moderator today is Professor John Yoon, Deputy D Executive Director of the Global Antitrust Institute and Associate Professor of Law at George Mason University Antonin Scalia Law School. Professor Yoon. Thank you to everyone at the, the Law Review and thank you to the GAI staff and uh, to the law school in general uh, and Five O'Clock Films. Really appreciate everything you guys have done. Um, welcome back to the 25th Annual George Mason uh, Law Review Antitrust Symposium. As Carly mentioned, my name is John Yoon. I'm a professor here at the Scalia Law School. This panel is Big Tech Antitrust Litigation. And uh, let me just jump right in and introduce our panelists and, and, and start us off. Uh, our first guest is Dirk Auer. He is the Director of Competition Policy at the International Center for Law and Economics, the ICLE. Uh, our second panelist is Elise Dorsey, who is currently a visiting scholar at the University of Virginia. And Elise is a former Scalia Law student. Um, and then we also have Michael Hausfeld, who is Chair Emeritus at Hausfeld LLP. Uh, I'm really excited to have this distinguished group uh, discuss a number of issues that I think are really pressing in antitrust. And, and I think these insights today are gonna be really valuable, at least for me, I'm, I'm really excited to hear what everyone has to say. So let me start with Elise and, and jump right in. Uh, oh, and let me just mention to the audience, if you have some questions, we have the Q&A open. Uh, please feel free to type it in. I can't guarantee I'll get to uh, your question, and I apologize for that, uh, but I will keep an eye on that. Elise, when we hear big tech antitrust litigation, um, you know, inevitably it, it likely invokes network effects and platforms, and this uh, sort of calls to mind the key case in this area, which is Ohio versus American Express. And it's really divided the antitrust community in terms of how do you assess a Sherman Act claim uh, when it involves uh, at least a transactional platform like credit cards, which was the subject of the case. Um, so one of the issues is what should the burden be for plaintiffs to demonstrate anti-competitive harm when you do have these network effects, uh, certainly in credit cards, but perhaps beyond? And uh, what's your reading on that? And, and, and um, is it too high? Yeah, thanks so much, John. Um, and thank you again to the GAI for inviting me to participate on the panel this afternoon. Um, you know, one of the things that really struck me while I was preparing for today's panel um, is just how much more enjoyable prepping for these panels is being in a position outside, um, you know, of the enforcement agencies, just having that little bit of distance I'm finding is, is quite nice. And I, I think that's a perspective um, a few of us can relate to here today. Um, because, you know, these really are some difficult questions and some of them really go to the heart of what modern antitrust law is and what it's trying to accomplish and how we want to get to the right results. So they're, they're not easy questions, you know, there's a reason we keep talking about them on, you know, panels like today. Um, to that end, you know, I think the simplest answer to your question is that, you know, we want the burden to be on the plaintiffs to present some reliable evidence that competition is likely to be impaired. Of course, you know, that's a pretty simple statement and actualizing that goal is, is really the sticky part. You don't want the burden to be impossible, but you also don't want it to be impossibly easy. You really want to get it right. And I think that's what the court was really attempting to balance in Amex. You know, it was dealing with a question which, at least so far, the courts haven't had a tremendous number of opportunities to address. Um, and that's one way um, in which I actually think the filing of, you know, several of these law several of these cases in the tech space um, might have some very real world benefits, right? Is that antitrust law in the US has always been very court driven and for antitrust precedents to keep, to keep pace with the marketplace, right? We really need um, courts to have the opportunities to engage and grapple with these really difficult issues. Um, you know, Milton Handler, you know, recognized this back, you know, in the mid 20th century that, you know, court development is going to be an iterative process and it's going to require some amount of trial and error. Um, and it's, it's the, really the ability of, of the courts to learn from and update their analyses. It's the real strength of the court system. Um, 
So I think in Amex, what, you know, the crux of what the court was struggling with was, you know, at what point do we believe that we have an accurate assessment of how competition in a platform market operates? Um, you know, and particularly in that case where, you know, net, network effects might be strongly at play, um, again, in a way that's somewhat new for the courts to be considering. I, you know, I think for, for the majority, you know, one of the things that was, was key in that case was, you know, the way in which the plaintiff's um, rendering of the case seemed to abstract away from some of those network effects that were so prominent in that market. So the plaintiff's case there, I think, really focused pretty heavily on, on one side of the marketplace, almost to the exclusion of the other, um, when both the court found that, you know, both sides of the marketplace were pretty intimately intertwined. Um, and so the court, I think, was left feeling pretty be skeptical that the analysis presented to them was capable of painting an accurate picture, right? They want to make sure that they understand the full scope, right? They're not, you know, missing the forest um, for the trees. Um, and I think that's, you know, a big part of what was, was driving their analysis there. I think that's a, a fairly fair read of the case. And I think it tends to vindicate some pretty traditional um, and core antitrust values and beliefs, right? Before we flip the burden over to the defendants, we want some reasonable assurance um, that doing so is warranted, right? That competition is likely to be harmed and reaching that conclusion in turn requires understanding, you know, how competition in the marketplace operates, right? And when network effects are strong, I think you really have to consider how those play in, right? What kind of competitive constraints are under other incentives they might be imposing upon the market in order to really make solid predictions or assessments of how competition is likely to bear out. Um, and I mean, I think, you know, an important note to keep in mind here, right, is I think that leaves open the possibility of first for some nuance here, right? There might be markets um, that, you know, are technically platforms, but where the network effects are more or less influential to the competitive landscape. Um, and that might want us to make might make us want to think a little bit differently about how certain behavior is likely to affect the marketplace. Um, but I think, you know, being able to articulate that um, is likely to be very important in these cases. Um, you know, I helped draft an amicus brief um, to the Supreme Court in Amex, and a lot of those themes, you know, were ones we were emphasizing, you know, that finding the right burden is important. Um, and you need to understand the market and utilize the appropriate tools and measures before you flip the burden. Um, in that brief in particular, we suggested that market-wide output might be a good proxy in these settings. Um, you know, price on one side or the other side of these markets, right, might go up or down. They might move in opposing directions. You know, one side of the market might be heavily subsidized while the other is not. Um, but, you know, if you can evaluate whether output in the market is increasing or decreasing, that might, you know, speak better to what is happening in the marketplace as a whole and so you know help us get to better predictions which again is ultimately the goal and what you know you want before you you flip the burden thank you thank you elise um let me stay on that theme and, and turn to michael uh, you know from the perspective of a very successful litigator um, can you walk us through how the three-step rule of reason paradigm um, actually works in practice rather than in academic articles um, how are efficiency arguments weighed um, in step two? Is, is it really given its due if they are credible? Um, you know, do courts really uh, pull out their spreadsheet and calculator? Or is the reality that it's kind of a, a, a it's hard to quantify and rather it's more um, less structured than, than one would imagine with this three-step paradigm that, that we always learn about? Let me say as well, thank you to everyone um, for you know inviting us to address these significant issues. As um, Elise just said, uh, this is uh, a matter of um, modern antitrust economics. And with regard to that, uh, the in applying the rule of reason of burden shifting um, to the Amex case, I think the court basically missed the universe through the stars. It's something that they got um, everything wrong. Uh, they got the law wrong, they got the burden wrong, they got the economics wrong, and they got the outcome wrong. So when you talk about a three-step process, the Supreme Court in Amex cut that process off at its knees or possibly even at its ankles. It only went to the, the, first, um, the first move, the first volley, and said that the plaintiff had to establish both the existence of, of a, a recognized restraint and then second, that there was no offsetting pro-competitive balance. That was not the way the rule of reason 
has up until Amex had ever been decided. If it would, if it would have, then it would have gotten beyond the first step, which the district court found that there was on the merchant side of the market, a clear burden placed upon um, the merchants by Amex in raising merchant fee acceptance fees. And at that point, the burden should have then shifted to Amex to prove that there was a pro-competitive justification or a, a pro-competitive defense that would have shifted the burden back to the plaintiff to show that either there was a less restrictive alternative or in balancing the restraint against the pro-competitive effect, that the restraint outweighed the pro-competitive effect or vice versa. And we'll get to that in a moment as to what you as a plaintiff would need to establish if you got past stage one and why it was improper for the court to cut the Amex proofs off at stage one, since that was never the law before. And it was never established that that is what had to be proven in order for a plaintiff to proceed beyond stage one. So what did the court get wrong in Amex? Amex involved essentially the fundamental competitive principle of steering. Steering in essence encompasses competition. How is it that a consumer um, would get the benefit of competitive pricing from those um, at the same horizontal level? And what is the benefit of having competitive pricing you know, at the horizontal level? Amex had an anti-steering rule. Amex basically precluded the merchant from steering customers at point of sale to using a less costly card in terms of a purchase that would have been made by a cardholder. And uh, the plaintiffs, the government asserted that Amex was able to do so because it had market power. The first thing that the court addressed was whether or not Amex had market power. In a vertical case, the court decided that, you, that market power could only be established through a relevant market which would principally you know, um, be denominated by market share. So it felt that Amex did not have market power. The dissent pointed out, we believe rightly, from an economic point of view, that market share may be um, a factor to inform the existence of market power, but is not the exclusive method by which to do so. Did Amex exercised power in the market to raise prices without a cost to Amex? The answer was yes, it did so. That, as Justice Breyer uh, said, said, that the proof of actual adverse effects on competition is a priori proof of market power. So Amex was able to raise prices to merchants in terms of acceptance of their cards not only once, but 20 times during a particular period of time without the loss of one merchant. Then what the court did was said, we have to look at a relevant market. If you prove market power in a normal case, you don't have to establish a relevant market. What the court then did was look at what the relevant market was in its majority you know, determination. It came up with a relevant market that had never before been defined, a two-sided platform involving a simultaneous transaction in, in, the, in the credit card industry. Was that a viable um, singular competitive, you know, uh, relevant market? That was another question that the court, according to a, a cadre of, of economists, got wrong as well. The relevant market should have um, been confined to the market in which the restraint was imposed. That would have been the merchant market. But would, have, would there have been a balancing under the majority opinion 
with regard to any offsetting pro-competitive benefit on the cardholder side. But what the court said with regard to that placed it it's itself at, at economic odds um, with, with fundamental economics. It essentially said that every restraint on one side of the market, the merchants, was offset by a balancing benefit on the cardholder side, to which there was absolutely no evidence of, nor was the government informed at the time that they had to establish that in the beginning. And moreover, that's almost a statement of, of um, a scientific principle applied to physics, that for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And that does not happen even in a two-sided, you know, um, simultaneous transaction market. As many economists pointed out, what you need to look at was whether or not competition at the margins was harmed. And economists said, if you took the proper approach to an economic evaluation, the merchant was harmed because it, it, it had to pay more for acceptance of the Amex card. The cu customer was harmed because the customer lost the ability to acquire a product at a lower price. In addition, there was harm to the competing car, uh, card um, carriers because they lost the sale that they might have gotten had steering been permitted. So putting that all together, if you got to the subsequent stages of the balance, plaintiffs would have established that there was a restraint on the merchant side. Amex could have come back and established why it, that um, they had offsetting uh, pro-competitive benefits applied to the cardholders, which then would have fallen to the plaintiff side to have to establish there was a less restrictive alternative available. And then there's really a fourth step. And the fourth step is the balance. There are a number of economists who, who say there's, there's got to be a netting of the cost, you know, the, co the cost effects and um, the uh, gain effects. But until economics, again, can approach the same degree of precision um, as physics, there is no mathematical formulation which produces calculate mathematical calculations which you can put on a literal scale and say which side outweighs the other. You would not need a court. You would just put the out you put the facts into a computer, put your algorithm in, and out would come an answer. Courts are still going to be dealing with an inability to actually quantify, you know, the, the costs of versus the benefits, and come up with some efficiency argument saying one um, outweighs the other. They are still going to be looking at the policy objective of the antitrust laws. And that is, is this an unreasonable restraint? And to that extent, um, the judge's decision or the court's decision can be informed by economics, but not dictated by it. Thank you, Michael. I really that was a, appreciate that. Um, Dirk, let me switch gears. Elise and, and Michael talked about the burden shifting, particularly as it relates to platforms. Um, you have this idea of antitrust dystopia. And so I kind of want to know more about it. Um, what does it mean? And can explain why are we having sort of unprecedented litigation against uh, big tech companies? Sure. So um, dystopia novels are some of my favorite books, right? That includes books like uh, 1984, Fahrenheit 451, or Brave New World. Now, for all their literary merits, these books are terrible predictors of the future. And it's not that they, got, they were completely wrong. So 1984 saw the ravages of communism. But what it failed to see is that communism would ultimately lose out. And um, in most areas in the world, people ended up living much freer lives um, than we would have imagined at the time. Um, similarly, for Fahrenheit 451 sort of saw that books and newspapers would lose their monopoly as a means of communication 
But what it did not see is that in the future, people will gain access to unparalleled knowledge compared to when the book was written. So more importantly, these dystopian narratives are not just a literary phenomenon. So for example, well, the ones I'd like to cite is in 1972, there was um, a very famous book published called um, The Limits of Growth. Uh, it's highly influential. It's, if you look at Google Scholar, it's got like 21,000 quotation sites, sorry. Um, and the authors argued this. They say, if the present growth trends continue unchanged, the limits to growth on this planet will be reached sometime within the next 100 years. The most probable result will be a rather sudden and uncontrollable decline in both population and industrial capacity. Now, to be fair, we're only halfway through that uh, 100 year timeline, but so far um, that prediction has not come to pass. It's quite the opposite. Um, global population and GDP have both roughly doubled, but famine has decreased tremendously. Uh, global income is more evenly distributed today than it was at the time and um, extreme uh, poverty has decreased by more than half. So in short, there's this history, both in, liter in the literature and sort of in uh, social science of um, dystopian thinking, where people sort of say, look at the future and say, this time is going to be different. We've got a real problem. But, you know, and then you, you look at, you look sort of 50 years later and the bad outcomes fail to materialize. Now, that's not saying that we should never worry about the future. But it is saying that um, we often tend to underestimate the forces and often the bottom-up forces like markets that can serve to um, provide a much brighter future than we expected. Now, at this point, you might be thinking, well, what does any of this have to do with antitrust law? Well, I would argue that um, dystopian thinking is also a phenomenon in antitrust literature. So I'll cite one example. In The Curse of Bigness, Tim Wu writes, big tech is ubiquitous. It seems to know too much about us and seems to have too much power over what we hear, do, and even feel. Their power feels like a kingly prerogative, inconsistent with our form of democracy. Um, I would argue that dystopian fears of this sort underpin many of today's efforts to regulate and bring antitrust claims against, um, against big, big tech firms, sorry. Now, you know, I think Tim Wu there is not a sort of appealing to readers on a technical basis, but there is actually an economic um, and technical argument that is mobilized um, to sort of support these dystopian claims. Um, and generally, I think it, you sort of critics make two um, connected arguments. The first is that data is the new oil. So they say that in the digital economy, the first firms to get a property right over the quote unquote, wells will dominate the marketplace. And the second claim is it pertains to data related incumbency advantages. And so critics say, well, there are extreme returns to scale and network effects that lead to the same result. So with that in mind, um, you, you, know, you see um, both scholars and uh, legislators and antitrust authorities calling for something that amounts effectively to a precautionary principle in antitrust. So certain expressions of this idea are, we should shift the, the, the burden of proof against defendants um, in antitrust cases, or we should create via legislation a list of sort of a blacklist of practices that big tech firms should not be in a, you know, allowed to implement. And you sort of see this happening in the United States in the ICOA bill and in Europe in the DMA. Now, the problem is I think there are, sort of, there are many, there are several problems with these claims, okay? So we can start with the argument that data is the new oil. Um, if you sort of think about it a little, uh, data is not at all similar to oil. So unlike oil, data is non-rival. So the, you know, the same data can be used by multiple economic agents at the same time and obtained from different sources, right? A second big difference is that data, unlike oil, is very hard to appropriate. So the fact that I have one piece of data, um, you know, if I obtain a piece of data as a platform about my users, it will be very hard, or it will be hard at least, to, um, to prevent my rivals from, uh, you know, either individually or via free writing, obtain that same piece of data. I can give an example, you know, when uh, you hear plaintiffs say, well, 
Amazon has this um, data advantage over its retailers, and it uses that to decide what Amazon basic goods it's going to launch. Well, the counter argument is, well, that, that means that when you see Amazon launch an Amazon basic goods, you can infer something about what it knows, right? It's not like it's kept its, its data and information perfectly um, private. So the upshot of all that is that if your market position is merely built on data, um, that, that advantage will be eroded the minute that rivals, um, either indirectly or you know, via sort of their own means, obtain similar data. You know, a second important response is sort of these um, data competition claims is that critics tend to underestimate the value of expertise as opposed to data, right? Um, in these cases, data and expertise are both necessary to obtain insights. And critics tend to assume that the data is the hard one to get of those two. But if you look at a couple of examples, it, it is clear that data is not the be all end all in these cases. So for example, in 1997, we all know that Google launched its search engine. It started with a tremendous data disadvantage compared to rivals, and it managed to overcome them pretty quick. You could take another example, like brick and mortar retailers. You know, before Amazon started its business, those brick and mortar retailers had a tremendous data advantage over Amazon. That didn't stop Amazon um, from thriving. You know, you can, okay, you can move to another claim. People say, okay, maybe it's not about the data. Maybe the problem then is that um, big tech firms benefit from extreme returns to scale. And again, when you sort of look down at, um, at the facts, the claim doesn't seem um, to withstand scrutiny. So the first problem with the extreme retain returns to scale story is that most of big tech's expenditures don't fit the pattern of something um, that benefits from increasing returns to scale. So if you look at Google, for example, its biggest um, expenditures are you know, traffic acquisition costs, data centers, bandwidth, administrative costs, sales and marketing. And it's not clear that any of those become cheaper for Google as output increases. Now that leaves about 20% of Google's expenditures that focus on R&D, but there too, the literature is not that, it's not particularly clear cut. So you'll see quite a few economists say, well, no, actually, R&D doesn't benefit from um, increasing returns to scale. So it doesn't, um, it doesn't become, you know, it doesn't require less, um, less input to gradually um, produce more out in a sort of innovation output. I guess, I, you know, that sort of leads me to a final point, which is, um, you know, with all of that in mind, people say, or well, critics make one, one last um, sort of data related argument, which is to say, well, the problem is um, data accumulation and the idea that um, sort of you see something equivalent to network effects with data. So the more data accumulates, the larger your, you know, proportionally, the larger your lead gets as an incumbent. But in fact, there's a, there's a pretty substantial empirical literature on data and the marginal benefits of data. And that literature is pretty unambiguous in saying that while more data does give you generally an advantage, that advantage has diminishing returns. And so we shouldn't expect to see the same sort of runaway, um, you know, runaway leaders as you might, sort of, you might um, expect in say the model of network effects. Um, so I guess sort of to conclude, um, I think that claims like data is the new oil or big tech firms will never be overthrown are a very poor description about what's happening in this space. A much better framing would be the learning by um, the learning by doing literature, where we say, well, yeah, there's there's some advantage to having more data, but it diminishes, and it's not the the only force that determines who's going to win the market. And finally, I think critics really underestimate the power of capital markets in this space. So often you'll hear claims like, well, the problem is that incumbents have data and they use that data to obtain ad revenue. And so an entrant is at a you know, tremendous disadvantage because they don't have that data and so they can't get ad revenue. But that sort of overlooks how all of these firms started, which is to get VC funding um, while you grow your, your user base. Um, 
so I, I, again, I think criticism sort of tends to miss the mark. And so um, where all of that leads me is that I think the error cost framework and the consumer welfare standard are still the right sort of basis for antitrust enforcement, because I don't think that something is fundamentally different this time and warrants precautionary enforcement. Thank you, Derek. Appreciate that. Um, I'm going to turn to Elise. Um, you've been in the building at both the FTC and the DOJ and spent some time there. And, um, you know, one of the things that have recently made news is that the FTC has rescinded the uh, vertical merger guidelines, which were just released, really. And um, there's also uh, some, some talk and most likely inevitable rescinding of the, the 2010 or revision of the 2010 horizontal merger guidelines. And I know prior panels have discussed this. I don't want to rehash that, but I am really interested in what your feeling is as someone who has been in, in both agencies, what impact changing guidelines has on, on courts and you know, maybe is it overstated? Is it understated? And, and how important is that stability? And, and what do you think is going to be the future for, for how the, the guidelines are, are used? Yeah. So, you know, I think um, as with many things in life and in antitrust, uh, balance here is key. Um, I'm, I'm concerned that withdrawing the vertical merger guidelines as quickly as they did does um, tends to do a bit of a disservice to the courts, potentially to the agencies themselves and to the public at large. Uh, you know, we went quite a long time with no real vertical merger guidelines to speak of, right? We had the DOJ guidelines that no one paid any attention to technically out there, um, but again, no one really paid any attention to them. And then, you know, after quite a bit of work, you know, public workshops, public commentary, you know, some years of back and forth and the agencies being very vocal about making this a priority and something they wanted to do, um, they put out a set of guidelines that I think were, you know, a fairly solid representation of what the agencies have been doing in their vertical merger analysis over the last several years and what they're likely to do in the next few years at least. Um, and I think, you know, that's it's a fairly modest goal and I think that's kind of been the driving force behind the power of the horizontal merger guidelines over the years in courts, right? Is it's, you know, reflecting, you know, really what the agencies have been doing for a long time. So the agencies have been able to prove to the courts time and time again, that they're hewing very closely to the analysis that they've publicly proffered in these documents, you know, that they are consistently acting over time and that any changes that they're adopting have been done so, you know, thoughtfully through demonstrated learning and also, you know, generally not on any sort of real, real partisan basis, right? It's, you know, they've been very consistent um, over time. And I think there's a pretty significant risk in withdrawing a set of merger guidelines um, in the way they did so quickly, where they really didn't have an opportunity to kind of be out there to test them in any way, um, in any meaningful way, right? So you, you can't say that they're particular shortcomings that were impeding the commission's ability to execute on their vertical merger guideline endeavors, um, you know, and with no clear explanation, again, as to the shortcomings, you know, explaining, for instance, you know, how it, how these guidelines fail to align with what the agencies are currently doing. Again, I think that's been the power of vertical merger, horizontal merger guidelines um, in the courts is it, you know, it tells the courts, you know, what the agencies are actually doing. Um, and, you know, I think there's, you know, kind of this notion out there um, that the agencies might have some hope of proffering something that's significantly more aggressive or radical later on, but that leaves us kind of in, in the lurch in the interim. Um, and again, I think the reason the courts have tended to be so deferential to the horizontal merger guidelines is that they found them to be very accurate reflections of how the agencies were enforcing existing law. Um, I think to the extent the agencies want to try to use the guidelines to, you know, radically change or expand the law, um, they're likely to meet with a lot more skepticism from the courts because that's just not, you know, historically what the agencies have done or how they have used these guidelines. Um, and so I think that's going to be a bit more of an uphill battle to the extent they're, they're deviating significantly or really trying to push the bounds through guidelines, um, again, when they the guidelines haven't been tested. I think that's been, again, a lot of the power of the guidelines, right, is when they've been updated, it's, you know, the agencies have been able to point to, you know, we have had these specific experiences over the last several years that have led us to make these specific um, adaptations to the guidelines. Um, 
and you know, kind of to, to that end, um, on the horizontal merger guideline side, it has been over a decade now since the last iteration were published. Um, and I think the agencies have accomplished a tremendous amount on the merger front in that time span. So I think the notion of beginning to consider whether any updates are warranted is likely a good exercise. Again, how this is ultimately accomplish, you know, whether the processes and the procedures line up with what they've tended to do in the past and how much they seek to push the ball forward um, will all matter a lot in terms of how the courts ultimately receive any new guidelines. Um, and I think, you know, again, to the extent you we see that agencies trying to use the horizontal guidelines not as a reflection of what they have been doing with modest and reasoned updates, but rather as an attempt to overhaul the analysis, I think that's going to be cause for, for a lot more skepticism and likely to create um, potentially a lot more headaches for the agencies as they attempt to bring their cases, um, you know, again, based upon untested or unproven theories, they get a lot of deference, um, you know, in the in the existing horizontal merger guidelines because of, you know, again, their longevity. And I think, you know, again, that's one of the, the things with the guidelines and them being considered over time is they didn't have to be perfect when they first came out. They just kind of, you know, needed to be an, a fairly accurate representation of what the agencies were doing. And so the courts have allowed them to grow, you know, and kind of expand and adapt over time as needed. Um, and I think, you know, putting that whole process in danger, you know, again, might be ultimately make it a lot harder for the agencies themselves and bringing cases because, you know, if they don't have the guidelines to rely upon that might put them in a much more difficult situation. Thank you, Elise. Um, Michael, um, the intersection of labor and antitrust is, um, it's always been important, but it, it feels like it's having its spotlight uh, right now. Um, you know, short of collusive agreements to fix wages, which are obviously a big problem, what other, what other types of antitrust claims could be brought involving labor? Uh, monopsonies, non-competes, where do you see sort of um, good litigation going forward? You've got monopsonies, oligopsonies. Um, you, you've got um, no poaching agreements. Uh, you've you've got any, in the words of of Section One, you know, contract, you know, um, or agreement that would affect the ability of a labor market, you know, to achieve, you know, um, a, a fair market value for the for their performance. Michael, what moves us from something that's sort of good coordination to where we start to worry? I know it's fact dependent, but you know, I think of organizations like the NFL and the NCAA where there's presumably good coordination that they can do, but there's also sort of bad coordination. And you know, I don't know if our, there are guiding principles that could we can rely on, or is it really just fact fact based and 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 it just depends i think what you've seen in both um the nfl and the and the ncaa is a segregation of um that which the association can do that relates to the rules of the game as opposed to the imposition of floors or ceilings on labor value um, you had the free agency, you know, uh, in, in the NFL, um, and now um, with regard to the NCAA, you've seen somewhat of, of the, well, clearly the dim diminishment of the concept of amateurism right. uh, and the ability of players to gain greater value for their performance, both in terms of um, more fulsome scholarships, as well as achieving some ability to um, maximize the economic value of their name, image, and likeness. Oh, that's that's been tremendous, and you know, I always see a paradigm as you mentioned, as it goes to the rules of the game. The closer we are to the actual physical field, in terms of the coordination, um, it just seems like it's a better, more likely to be something that's promoting and and helpful to all those involved. And the further we get away from that field, um, I think that's when when concerns start to, to, to rise. And I think in this, in this field is kind of responding to what Dirk has said, um, the, the NCAA and sometimes the NFL, you know, and, and others um, put out this, this, this dystopian um, paradigm that, oh my goodness, if you remove the restraint, um, the, the game will end. Um, th this will, 
decimate you know, pro football or, or college athletics. Um, on the other side, in the area, for example, of two-sided you know, simultaneous platforms, there's the utopian view. Um, if, if you go with uh, maximiz maximizing consumer welfare, all you do is measure, measure efficiencies. If you have an efficiency, then you will let um, that merger proceed or that platform proceed as is. Every situation isn't chicken little, um, no, nor is it, you know, uh, the world is great. Guidelines are not the law. They are guidelines. They are putting um, flesh on the bones of a, of a court being able to apply facts to the law, which still is policy driven, not it is, it can be economically informed, but there needs to be an understanding that there will be differences of opinion, you know, within economics. As a, a number of noted economic scholars have said, when it comes to the digital platform market, economists haven't yet decoded the effects fully. Well, there's a, again, a dis, there's a distinction between decisions, which, which are being um, many times advocated and attributed to others as being the dystopia, and investigation, which if you have something new, as one um, economist this morning said, that the law has traditionally uh, and historically dealt with static markets. When you have new dynamic markets, some of the economic principles do not necessarily fit perfectly or will have different effects. And you've got to understand what those effects are in that new um, form of dynamism. So although you haven't got decisions one way or another, just because someone wants to do something or declare something illegal, you should have the ability to investigate, to determine what are the realities in the markets and whether or not you have been able to apply economic principles in an informed manner appropriately to come up with the best solution um, that a human can make as opposed to a machine. Yeah, I, I really uh, agree with you on the dynamic versus static point. I think that's really the lens in which we have to use. And so um, actually staying on digital markets and, and Durka, let me turn to you and ask you about, um, and again, I've heard it from the prior panels, we're hitting everything again, but we have different panelists and different views. So I, I, I don't feel too bad about asking these questions again. Yeah. Um, Self-preferencing, right? It's an allegation in, in several cases, uh, predominantly in Google and the EU's Google search shopping case. Um, you know, what is, uh, the mechanism of harm in, in these cases, um, you know, what's the remedy and, and, you know, obviously what's your view on, on perhaps the, the alternative pro-competitive aspects of these types of behaviors? Hey, sure. So um, the main point of law addressing the Google shopping ruling in Europe is sort of the distinction between, uh, on the one hand, self-preferencing as a fear of harm, and on the other hand, uh, refusals to deal. So. The case started because Google's rivals, like found them, uh, complained about two things to the commission. So on the one hand, Google demoted this in its organic search results. And on the other hand, Google offered preferential placement to its own services via the Google shopping box. Okay. And the European Commission was you know, very receptive to these calls. It picked up the case and um, it was immediately confronted with the following problem. The natural solution to, uh, to make its case was to frame it as a refusal to deal, right? Saying, well, you know, rivals aren't getting access to that shopping box. And the natural remedy, if the commission had been successful with that case, would have been for Google to grant access to rivals to its shopping box, presumably at a franc rate. But going down this path would have been very difficult for the commission. Right? Under European law, the Commission, if it wants to show refusal to deal, it has to show, among other things, that access to um, the infrastructure that's being uh, sort of, uh, for which access is being claimed, that access is indispensable for rivals to, rivals to compete. And the Commission wisely, I think, ascertained that that was not likely to be the case for Google search. 
So sensing these difficulties, the commission decided to go in another direction and, um, and framed its case as, an, as a self-preferencing theory of harm. So when it did that, and it was, you know, that was a speculative or an un, it was uncertain at the time that that theory of harm would fly before European courts. But the commission reasoned, well, this is going to be much easier, right? If the court accepts that, all I need to show is that Google favored its services over those of rivals and that it harmed the competitive process. The commission does that. It brings its case. It, it reaches a decision. The case goes to court. And the European Court of Justice rules in favor of the commission. And so you might say, great, you know, the commission got what it wants, rivals got what they wanted, everyone is happy. Um, and that's not what happened. And the question is, why is, that, why is that the case? Well, the answer is that as soon as the commission framed its case as self-preferencing and not a refusal to deal, it effectively narrowed the fear of harm, right? The problem was no longer rivals not gaining access to the Google search platform, the problem was um, that they were that access was being denied in a discriminatory manner, and the problem was the discrimination, not the outcome. And you can probably see where this is going, because Google effectively said, "Well, okay, you want fairness, you want no self-preferencing, no problem. I will do that. We'll create an auction box, and everyone will be able to play to to bid for 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 placement on Google Shopping." Um, rivals did not like that. They say that they're unable um, to win those auctions. And whatever you, may, you think about that claim, um, there doesn't seem to be anything discriminatory about it. Now, there is one more technical um, uh, argument that has been raised against Google, which is to say this. Some scholars have said, well, in fact, this is discriminatory. Why? Because Google takes money from one pocket and it puts it in the other pocket. So Google doesn't really compete with rivals. It doesn't pay for placement. But that's wrong as a matter of economics because it completely ignores that every time that Google um, places a bid and wins a bid for shopping box placement, there's an opportunity cost. It's foregoing revenue from rivals. And once you count the opportunity cost, Google is not getting a free lunch any more than, other, than another rival is doing when they bid for placement on the shopping box. Okay. Um, so in a way, we're back to square one and we say, okay, well, um, this auction system is non-discriminatory. And I think that sort of this case and the, the whole story, um, it's a really important policy lesson. It, it's a really important lesson for policymakers, right? Because very often when you hear people um, talking about self-preferencing, trying to make um, legislation about self-preferencing or bringing self-preferencing claims before courts, what they really want isn't to sort of reduce some kind of discrimination. Their problem isn't really with self-preferencing. The problem is with um, that, you know, be it legislators, be it rivals, they want to gain access to the platform, um, you know, either on front terms or even better for free, right? And that has nothing to do um, with platforms preferencing their services. It just has something to do with their market position. And everyone, so everyone here knows that under US antitrust law and even under European competition law, um, firms are allowed to charge monopoly price. And I think it's um, an important and desirable feature of those laws that firms can do that, right? We all, I think everyone recognizes that at least to some extent that gives firms um, incentives to create and improve their products. You know, sort of a, you know, looking into the future a little, it does seem that these, very, these same issues are going to crop up either if the App Store bill is passed in the United States or if Epic Games ends up winning its, um, its antitrust case against Apple. You'll have exactly the same thing where people are talking about self-preferencing, but um, the, the sort of non-discrimination will not achieve the outcome that I think they're hoping for. Um, I could, you know, I'm going to let others speak and I'm sure many have already defended self-preferencing and its potential consumer benefits. I'm not gonna do that now. Thank you, Derek. Um, you know, Elise, I wanna talk about, I'm gonna stay in, the, in, the, in Europe here. You know, the UK has brought a Facebook Giphy case and Giphy, uh, I'm not that familiar with it, but I, I think there's just, I think it's just literally GIFs uh, available. And, you know, if you were gonna bring this type of case in the US, would this be a vertical case? 
or and or would this be um, a nascent acquisition, um, certainly perhaps in the area of advertising? And so um, how do you see this? And um, would this have any legs in the U.S.? Yeah, so like you, I'm not overly steeped in the facts of the case, so I don't want to speculate too wildly, um, you know, just wildly enough for, you know, a Friday afternoon antitrust panel, I think. Um, I would also like to say I saw um, an article, a Vice article recently um, proclaiming that gifts are now for boomers. Um, and it was investigating how gifts are currently uncool with the younger generations, although they still seem to be very popular and it quite often used. Um, so, and they, the article actually went on to note that um, the GIF was invented back in 1987, which was a great year. Um, and that GIFs have already come into and fallen out of popular favor multiple times in that, you know, 30 plus years. Um, so, you know, perhaps that tells us something about the GIFs likely longevity and perhaps something about the strategic nature of expanding into that space. Um, but in any event, um, the UK's case seemed to focus on two particular ways in which this merger um, might harm competition. And the first was in the supply of display advertising due to, they said, horizontal effects arising from a loss of dynamic competition. Um, and the second was in the supply of social media services um, worldwide and also in the UK due to ver potential vertical results resulting from um, input foreclosure. Um, and kind of given the, the basics and, you know, what the UK was laying out, um, I think if you're going to try to carve out a nascent competition claim here in the US in this setting, it would be more likely to be on that first point on the advertising side. Um, so the, the UK authorities seem to find that Giphy was potentially tapping into something a little different in this space. Um, they noted that at the time of the merger, Giphy was the only significant provider of GIF-based advertising services. And my sense was that the UK authorities seemed to think um, GIF-based advertising had some interesting opportunities and that Giphy was uniquely situated to capitalize on those opportunities. Um, so they argued that one of Giphy's key innovations was its paid alignment advertising proposition, which it first began offering in 2017 in the US and you know, was making efforts to expand at the time of the merger. Um, and the CMA also found um, that in the context of this merger, Facebook required the termination of all of Giphy's paid alignment activities. Um, so I think if you, you know, kind of start putting those facts together, you could potentially um, start lining up a nascent competition claim. You know, I think what you want to look for in that sort of claim in the U.S. is to be able to show that the target was in some way specially positioned um, to make the new competitive landscape that was, you know, being contemplated a reality. Um, so to the extent you could begin making that showing, you know, for instance, that Giphy had particular characteristics or particular market position that lent it certain, you know, significant advantages um, that it would otherwise have become a meaningful competitor to Facebook and digital advertising, um, you know, you could, I think, potentially start conceiving of a case there again, you know, I think it's, um, you know, these cases are challenging to bring, right, they, they're very heavily fact dependent, um, you know, so kind of given, you know, my limited understanding of the facts and, you know, what the, what the UK authority brought to bear, I think, you know, there's certainly an interesting exercise to be done there and whether you can make a cognizable um, nascent competition claim. Um, on the vertical side, the UK authority then argued that um, there was a likely decline in the supply of social media services. They found that um, the social media and messaging apps have only a few alternatives to Giphy. Um, the UK in particular identified Tenor, which is owned by Google as Giphy's only close competitor. And they found that Giphy currently allows apps, including social media apps like Snapchat, um, TikTok, and Facebook and Instagram, um, to integrate Giphy's um, GIF and GIF sticker databases to their own platform via um, an API or SDK free of charge. Um, and they were concerned um, that if Facebook could disadvantage these rivals by limiting their access in some way, um, you know, that might be some sort of input foreclosure. Again, I think it's, you know, interesting, potentially challenging again in the U.S. It kind of, you know, made me think back to, you know, some of the ATT um, Time Warner cases, right, where, you know, I'm not, I'm not overly convinced of, you know, how important gifts are to a social media platform or its base. Um, but I think that's a really, you know, kind of interesting question and, you know, interesting to see again, um, the nascent competition thing on the, on the advertising side, I thought, you know, is potentially 
um, you know, pretty interesting to play around with. Um, the, the, the vertical case I, struck me as a little bit um, more difficult um, in some senses, but again, you know, some, some really interesting areas and really um, difficult questions to play around with there, for sure. Thank you, Elise. Um, Michael, you know, uh, all eyes are on FTC Facebook and the DOJ uh, Google case in the state's case against Google. Um, you know, are there thoughts you want to share with us on how you think those are going to turn out or or, the, or um, how they're, they're gonna proceed. And I'm just, uh, while you're here, I, I wanted to get your thoughts on that. John, I'd rather not give a prognostication as to the outcome, but more as to the process, if I That's can. Fair. And I think um, Dirk um, basically, possibly un unbeknownst to him, ha has set forth the, the, the two ships, you know, passing each other in the, in the proverbial night. Um, just as, as the courts have essentially limited per se rules of illegality to just a certain small group of offenses um, and established a rule of reason for all others, I do not believe that with regard to the digital markets, as Dirk and others seem um, to advocate, there should be a rule of per se legality for what is done. If you, if you adopt um, the fact that we are dealing with a digital market in terms such as self-prefacing, default installations, digital ecosystems, gatekeepers, um, terms that, again, economic scholars and academicians have um, admitted are, a more are representative of a more dynamic market than courts have traditionally uh, addressed uh, competition issues, then we're dealing with a new paradigm. And if we're dealing with a new paradigm, possibly the old law and economics paradigm of structure, uh, conduct, and, and performance doesn't apply. I think in looking at, at these new markets, we need a new paradigm. All the antitrust laws, and I want to get to fragmentation in a minute, you know, um, tend to focus on conduct, no matter what. That, that is the bedrock of antitrust. What is the conduct that we're seeking, you know, to address? And take that conduct in whatever form it comes in, whether it be growth, whether it be contract, agreement, you know, um, combination, uh, merger or acquisition, and you add to that, you know, uh, then structure. And structure should be more than just size. And it shouldn't be benchmarked, you know. If you have twenty percent, if you're, a, you know, a, if you have dominance, um, because abuse of dominance does not necessarily capture some of the aspects of the digital platform markets. And then, when you look at the conduct and the structure, look at the effects that economists help inform result from that conduct and that structure. And then add to that, once you see the, the aggregation of the conduct, the structure, and the effects, then look at the harm. What harm do you see is being caused? If you apply that analysis, then you can, you, you can apply your balancing of all those factors, not with any mathematical precision, but against your policy, whether it be US law or European law of what is an unreasonable restraint, what is an unfair practice, um, what is a, an abuse you know, of a dominant position, however you define it. But without that kind of investigation and application, I strongly disagree with the per se illegality of all aspects of, of the digital operations. Thank you, Michael. Um, Dirk, let me... Uh, turn to you, um, and and this will this might get close to the end here for us. Um, you know, part of the, the pitch of the new leadership of the DOJ is they want to look at Section Two more holistically, and um, where sort of a series of of small cuts can lead to sort of a, a mortal wound eventually. And um, you know, they recently have talked about network effects on on specifically Facebook's platform. 
and multiple sort of smaller anti-competitive acts can exponentially reinforce themselves due to the existence of network effects. Um, you know, what's your view of this theory? Um, is this a practical theory? And um, just overall, how, how do you implement this if, if this was gonna happen? Sure, so, um, you know, first, just briefly responding to Michael, um, you know, I, I, I'm not at all in favor of per se legality. And I, I, you know, and on, on that front, I agree with you entirely. We should have, um, you know, fact intensive investigations. And that's, you know, I think no one thinks that that's not important. Um, the problem, I think, and it goes to uh, John's question, is when we have these sort of um, what I'd call hybrid theories of harm that are mobilized, where um, sort of anti competitive harm is alleged to occur because of two um, different, two or more different components. And a good example of that is, again, the Google shopping case in Europe, where the, the commission says, well, the harm comes from not just um, Google demoting, but also, on the other hand, um, not giving access to the Google shopping box. I think, to me, that, that raises sort of two points. The first is, for defendants, it's an extremely difficult proposition, right? You get um, sort of that's the position where Google was in its case, where it puts forward an empirical study saying, well, you know, this demotion via, via the um, this organic search demotion did not create anti-competitive foreclosure. And we think we have the evidence um, to prove it. And the court says, well, it doesn't matter. You know, I don't need to assess that evidence because it's only part of the anti-competitive conduct. So your problem. Now, I'm not saying that would be the case in the United States, but I think it's definitely very com complicated for firms if you're faced with um, a deferential judicial review, sort of defend yourself against these um, multiple claims. The second point I want to make is more specific to network effects, because a lot of these claims sort of, um, they're, they're, they're based on, on an idea that uh, network effects are an unassailable barrier to entry. So it's often the claim is network effects plus something is going to equal um, anti-competitive behavior and monopoly. And I think, again, going, you know, maybe we come at, we get to the problem from different points of view, but in a way, I, maybe Michael would even agree that to me, these network effects claims need to be assessed on a case by case basis and they need to be assessed rigorously. And I would just say, there is a long history of economic, economists um, taking these theoretical models of externalities and saying that they apply in the real world. And that, that the second part has not always been true. So we've seen very famous economists make claims such as there can be no markets for bee pollination. There can be no such thing as a privately run lighthouse. The tragedy of the common means that um, all um, common pool resources are going to be overconsumed. And that is not automatically the case. So we need to have factual investigations and when it comes to digital markets, we can't just say, well, network effects plus behavior equals, um, equals monopoly, equals anti-competitive foreclosure. We need to look at um, practical things like, is there multi -polling? Do we see users switching? What is the cost for users to switch? Do users have mechanisms by which they can collectively move from one platform to another? And I'll finish with one last thought, which is we have seen over the last decades many platforms emerge in markets with network effects. We've seen Zoom and TikTok um, in markets that are sort of the definition of network effects, and they don't seem to have struggled all that much um, against rivals. We've seen the same in the sort of the video industry with Netflix overcoming Blockbuster, and we've seen the same thing in the search industry with Google beating Yahoo. So again, I don't want to say, and I wouldn't say, that we should have per se legality, that would be you know, that would be completely wrong. But what we should do is be a bit careful um, when we look at cases and not assume that um, just, you know, just because there's a claim that these firms are unassailable and because they may look unassailable, that doesn't mean it's necessarily the case. Thank you, Dirk. And um, I'm looking at the time and, and uh, we, we still have some, but I don't mind giving everyone 10 minutes of their Friday back. Um, but uh, I'm looking around for if anyone had any closing, closing thoughts or, or any follow-ups that you want, I wanted to give you an opportunity. Um, 
but uh, um, yeah. oh oh Elise go ahead I'm sorry okay <laughs> no 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 I'm sorry I was just gonna say you know I had a chance briefly um, yesterday afternoon to talk with Bill Kabasik about you know this tech litigation and you know one of the things we were discussing was how far out the trial dates seem to be and how far you know even the agencies are requesting them and you know just kind of thinking you know again in terms of you know like that's just the trial date and then you know any opinion and if there's any appeals just how how long this is taking right and if there's a way you know more practically to just you know, kind of bring them quicker, right? If they're, you know, we were, I guess, you know, just kind of toying with the idea of like, how do we, you know, make this a little bit more workable, right? I think, you know, especially when these investigations have already been going on for a few years, and in some cases, right, involve some conduct that, you know, was from several years back, I think, you know, we really want it to work a little bit more quickly. And, you know, I think, um, you know, one of the things that struck me potentially is, you know, the, you know, letting perfect be the enemy of the good, right? You know, you might not necessarily have a perfect case, but I would think you know the the you know the companies for sure and the agencies as well right have very talented people who could put together you know very good cases within a much shorter timeline um so you know i don't know if any of the other panelists kind of have thoughts on you know how we might implement that in practice but i think you know that's something that's you know really important too is you know if we have to wait years for the case opinions to come out um you know it's it's again kind of an impediment to actually building out the antitrust law in this area thank you elise and Michael? John, one, of, one of the things that you brought up um, was <clears throat> economic thinking and, and antitrust or competitive thinking, you know, in Europe, um, which presents in, in the digital platform markets a, a unique issue um, of fragmentation or harmonization. Mm. Um, and that goes along with remedies. Uh, again, in the digital market, the, the traditional remedies um, may not be susceptible to easy application. Uh, you cannot tell um, a, a Microsoft or, or, or a, an Apple or a Google, um, you have to divest a certain segment, you know, of your, your, your platform. Um, and just as the European Union is struggling with coming up with a harmonized uh, vision of principles uh, for digital platforms within the union, so that you don't have fragmentation uh, by member states, there is a ubiquitousness, you know, um, to uh, digital platform technology and, and influence that transcends uh, political or geographical boundaries. How do how do we approach that harmonization so a business, you know, such as the ones we're talking about in big tech, um, can operate seamlessly in all those jurisdictions, knowing that there's clarity as to what conduct is or is not, you know, uh, crossing a line. All of these, I think, need to be considered um, as we approach addressing um, the modernization um, of antitrust principles to a, a highly digital world. And I truly appreciated the, your question about gifts and Elisa's remarks about them. To know um, from a personal perspective, that I wasn't really behind the times because I didn't know what a gift was to begin with. Well, Michael, now I see why you win so often. What a close. Um, so, you know, with that, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Elise. Thank you, Dirk. Um, this concludes this session. Um, please, to everyone attending, um, thank you. And, and, and please be back at 315 for our final panel competition in the Americas. So with that, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Stay well. <laughs>